Let's pray together. Morning, Jeanette. Good to see you. Let's pray. Lord, our Father, the Lord of love, Lord, we are spiritually thirsty, we are spiritually hungry, and thank you for the amazing gift of your word. And Lord, I pray as we come before your word today, would it accomplish what you intend for it in each of our lives? Lord, continue to transform us, we pray. Father, challenge us where we need it. Comfort us where we need that, Lord. And may it all be for the glory of Jesus and his renown. Amen. Amen. Just before I say anything else, what a remarkable day at Twickenham yesterday. You know, I wasn't there, sadly, but it wasn't that extraordinary. Amazing. And then in Cardiff, and then in Paris. We had six hours of rugby. Well, there was a bit of rugby being played, watched amongst other things, uh, yesterday afternoon. But um, it's great to see the Northern Hemisphere coming back a little bit, isn't it? You know, not that we're competitive between hemispheres. Anyway, that's not what we're focusing on at all. But rugby is, oh, it's a great gift from the Lord, isn't it? Um, I don't know about you, I, I get incredibly excited when an invitation comes through the post. And you kind of open the envelope and you see this invitation. And it, it's personally addressed to you. And you think, that person's been thinking of me or thinking of us. And they want us to be present on this occasion. And I know that when our daughter Livy and Jeremy got married this summer, they really wanted everyone who received an invitation to know how much they wanted them to be there. It was really important to them. I remember um, a few years back now, receiving an invitation to the opening of Parliament to hear the Queen's speech. And it wasn't for any merit of my own. It was simply that a relative of mine had a position in the House of Lords at the time, and I got an invite. But it was, it was great to receive it. Far, far, actually just in relation to that, I borrowed Alan Murray's father's morning suit. And it really wasn't the right size at all, but it was great to be there. Far, far more important, the Bible, as Billy Graham once said, is one long invitation to come to God. Isn't that a great insight? And the most amazing truth. It's one long invitation to come to God. So if anyone asks you, what's the Bible about? That's a good starting point, isn't it? One long invitation to come to God. Because if we take ourselves back to the beginning, after Adam had you know, disobeyed God's instruction, what, what is God's response? What's the Father's response? There's an anguished cry. Adam, where are you? Adam, come back to me. And then we hear this same cry throughout the Old Testament. And particularly in the Minor Prophets, we hear them repeatedly telling, calling out the, the Israelites, come back to God. Come back to Yahweh. And it, from Jesus... So many times in the Gospels, we read his invitation to come. His ministry was an invitational ministry. John 7, come all you who are thirsty, come and drink. Matthew 11, come all you who are weary, take my yoke upon you. I will give you rest, come to me. And then right at the end of, end of the scriptures, uh, the final chapter in the book of Revelation, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who is thirsty come. And the Father again issues that invitation to us. Come, come back to me. Come walk closely with me. And at the heart of this passage in Isaiah 55, we hear that invitation to come. In fact, we hear it four times in the first two verses. Come, come to me. And as we go, you know, as we dig into this passage today, 
I want us to understand that in coming to the Lord or in coming back to him yet again and again, we are crowning him the Lord of love. It is in coming to him that we crown him. And Isaiah gives us four reasons, four reasons to come to the Lord. And the first is this, come and receive his outrageous generosity. Come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And it's helpful to remind ourselves that this, this word has been given to the people of Israel who are in exile in Babylon. And Babylon was the center of commerce. And so... They were a trading people. They'd become a trading people. And God speaks to them kind of as if he were a a market stall holder. Come, come and see these exotic spices. Come and see these silks. And I love the way God speaks to us in a medium that relates to us. He does that so naturally because he wants to communicate with us. We see Jesus doing that repeatedly in his ministry to the crowds gathered around him. He says, look at the lilies of the field. Look at the birds of the air. And they think, yeah, I understand that. And don't be surprised when God speaks to you prophetically or God speaks to you in a dream through a medium that just relates to you. It might be that you dream, you know, if you're a musician, it might have a musical resonance to it. It might be if you love the outdoors. You know, you might start dreaming about being in the mountains or skiing or whatever it is. And actually, the Lord is wanting to whisper something to you. I remember about eight or nine years ago, the time when Fee and I were co-leading one of the New Wine Weeks. About a week before, and there, there was a huge amount of prep still to do. I remember one night, the Lord spoke to me in a dream. And the dream was that I was playing rugby again. And uh, the coach was, was yelling at me from the touchline, Andy, stay in position, stay in position. And um, I knew that, the, you know, when I woke up, I knew the Lord was speaking to me through that because he speaks in a medium that he, he, he knows will understand. And in doing that, he says, I know you, I understand you. And that's what he's saying to his people, people in exile. I'm still your God. I'm Yahweh. I understand. I see you. I know you feel lost and in exile, but you're not lost to my sight. Come, come buy wine and milk. And, and the Lord is reminding them that he is the one, he is the only one that can truly satisfy that can truly quench our thirst and our hunger. Plato once compared human beings to leaky jars. And and Plato thought we could never be fully satisfied because we will always leak. It's only the living God who can truly satisfy us. A very profound Swiss psychologist, Christian Swiss psychologist called Paul Tournier, who kind of wrote in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. He said this. He said, Let us as Christ followers discover what modern people are seeking, that we are thirsty for God. People are seeking for answers to those questions which science pays no attention. The problem of their destiny, the mystery of evil, the question of death. We know that in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, we are shown the direction of the truth that only God can reveal to us and that actually that, that meets that hunger, that searching, that questioning in our spirits and in our souls because Jesus is the truth. And he has revealed insights for us as to what our destiny will be if we place our trust in him after this life. Come. Come because he is outrageously generous. Just outrageously generous. 
He loves to bless us. I don't know about you, but this autumn, if we can have the next slide up, please, Debs. This autumn, uh, this isn't taken near Paul, by the way. Um, it's actually in, in, in North America. But um, we've had better colors than this around Paul, actually, haven't we? Yeah, we should have had one of those. But I think this autumn, we have had the most spectacular colors. Uh, there have been russets I haven't seen for decades. And for me, it's just a, a tiny glimpse of God's extraordinary creativity and his generosity. And our God, the Lord of love, says, come to me and receive from my outrageous generosity. You might feel you have nothing to bring to him, but the offer is free. What market stall holder is interested in, in, in a buyer who doesn't have any money? They're not, are they? But our Father is. So come to the Lord of, come to the Lord of love and receive his outrageous generosity. A second reason to come to the Lord of love is to see his purposes in our lives. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. See, I've made him a witness to the peoples, peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God. Isaiah is saying that actually a second reason is because the Lord of love is the Lord of faithfulness who keeps his covenant. And he's referring here to hesed, which is the Hebrew word for covenantal love. There's a, a, a lovely symbol in a Jewish wedding. You've probably heard me mention this before. That at a certain point, the bridegroom takes off his, his, his coat or his jacket and places it around his bride's shoulders as a symbol that he is committing to his bride. Covenantal, loyal, faithful love. And that's just a tiny reflection of our faithful God. And Isaiah knows full well that some of, some of his hearers won't have experienced parental love or marital love that expresses that. They might have experienced, experienced parental love that is fickle. And so as a child, you kind of wake up in the morning, you just don't know how your mother is going to be or how your father is going to be. We have a, a father, who, a heavenly father, who is totally different, who every morning will smile at us and say, I cherish you. I cherish you. Yeah, there's things we still need to work on together, but I cherish you. And I smile. I smile at you. And then Isaiah points his hearers to, to David. And he's, he's saying, see David. David who is the leader of, of Israel. The celebrated leader of Israel. Who we know wasn't perfect. But what David encouraged Israel to be to the nations, so too we know Jesus came as a light to the whole world. And as Christ's followers, we are called to be that light. Jesus was David's greater son, as it were. And we, as Christ's followers, are called to be a light with Christ to the world. So he's pointing, to, he's pointing to David as an example. He's pointing to Israel to say, your calling was never just to receive God's generosity for yourself. Your calling was to be a conduit of his blessing. And that's part of God's purposes for me and for you, for us as a church community, to be a conduit of his blessing. And that's why our gift day today is a precious part of that. You know, we can... We can all play our part. Every single gift, no matter how large or small, 
makes a difference. And it makes a difference because it equips our ministry, equips us for mission so that we can shine more brightly for Jesus. We can reach, more f- we can reach further for Jesus. But also, giving transforms us, doesn't it? As Justin said a few weeks ago, giving makes us more like our Father. It transforms us that we become more generous, that we shine like our our Father, who is the Lord of love. And that's his purpose for us as well. Come, see his purposes for your life. And a third reason that Isaiah gives as to why the people should come, and it's as if the tone begins to change slightly here. Come, because now is the time. Now is the time. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. You know, Isaiah is saying, this is a kairos moment. This is a now moment it's a, it's a cry from the Father's heart to his people. My people, this is an important moment. Don't miss it. And there are times when our Father says that to us. He can say that to us as a whole church community. This is a time. Don't hold back from me. This is a time to step into my purposes because he's at work in a heightened way. This is is a time to respond. And I'm sure you've known that if you've walked with the Lord for some time, that actually the Spirit will lay on your heart and your mind the reality, this is a time to align yourself with what God is doing at at this moment in a special way. It's a time to step forward. A few years ago, a number of church leaders were, were quoting this from 2 Samuel 5, 24. When you hear the sound of marching in the balsam trees, move. It's time to act decisively. And there are those moments that the Lord brings across our path. And he says, will you partner me, with me? Will you go for this? Will you not hold back, but step out, go for it? And at this particular moment, Isaiah is saying, this is a karos moment of repentance seek the lord let the forsake let the wicked forsake their their evil ways it's a time to turn around to turn back to god's purposes to turn away from just pleasing yourself and to walk in the ways of holiness and of joy true joy A time for repentance. I love the child's definition for that. To be sorry enough to stop doing what you're doing. And I I wonder as we approach Advent, I wonder is there anything the Lord is is wanting just to lay on your heart, not in in a heavy way. He will never condemn, but he does convict. So he wants us to walk in holiness. Is there something the Lord is saying to you at the moment? Hey, do you know what? It's time to stop doing that because that doesn't lead you in the path of life and peace. That doesn't allow you to shine for me in your workplace or in in some of your social settings. Is there something the Lord is saying? It's time to stop doing. And it also is the Lord saying, hey, you know you need to come back to that discipline or you need to come back to that relationship that kind of needs repairing. What is the Lord saying to you? Now is the time. Because there are moments when he does that. And the wonderful thing is when we come back to the Lord in repentance again, there are no conditions around it. It's categorical. He, we hear, he will freely forgive. 
you will know his mercy and his cleansing. And we have complete assurance of that because of the cross, because of the empty cross. And as we were thinking, two, thinking last Sunday, two chapters before in Isaiah, Isaiah 53, speaks about what the suffering servant was going to accomplish for all humanity on the cross. And that's why we have that great assurance when we come back to him, when we repent. But also, his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. They're higher. And there's always more the Lord longs to show us. There's always more he longs to show us about his kingdom and about his ways. Some of you will be quite familiar with the story of Howard Carter, who was an adventurer and a, a British archaeologist who discovered the, t- the tomb of Tutankhamun. And um, it's a kind of you know, well-celebrated story that as he was kind of peering into the entrance to the tomb, the Earl of Carnarvon asked him, Carter, what can you see? And he said, I see wonderful things, wonderful things, wonderful things. And do you know, as we prepare for Advent, as we begin to think about Jesus' first coming, the Word made flesh, the extraordinary miracle and mystery of the incarnation, the Lord wants to show us more wonderful things. He has more wonderful things for you to gaze on. You know, until glory, we're going to be discovering more wonderful things. So come, because now is the time. And no ear has heard, no eye has seen, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And a fourth and final reason we're given in this, in this passage to come to the Lord of love is to come and be transformed. Come and be transformed. Come and go on being transformed. The Lord promises that as we come to him, as we come back to him, our lives will be fruitful. Isn't that wonderful? He promises our lives will be fruitful. We won't always be aware of the impact of it. We won't always see it for ourselves. But Jesus is a transformer. That's what he does. And when we come to him, and when we come before his word, it's transformative. The Spirit takes his word and it transforms. And it... And the Lord can do it so creatively in so many different ways. It might be a word in your quiet time in the morning that is just so important for how you might need to conduct yourself in a difficult work situation. It might be a prophetic word that someone sends to you. And, and sometimes they won't know the impact or the kind of relevance of it. So I was thinking about that this, this past week. I was reminded just, just after Easter, after I'd, you know, after I'd had a medical diagn- diagnosis that I needed a op in a few months' time, my spiritual di- director, who, who didn't know about my medical condition, just sent me a message. And um, she's a really profound, incredibly wise old la- older lady. She's in her mid-80s now. And she's not given to flights of fancy at all. But she said, Andy, I was praying for you again this morning, and I just felt the Lord just have four words for you. And it was this, I will sustain you. I will sustain you. And do you know what? Amongst all the care and support and love and, and prayer over, over those months and over the infection and things like that that followed it, Those four words were so important to me. And that's the power of God's word. We know for us as a church community that over the years, the Lord has given us words that have directed our path 
Enlarge the place of your tent. That comes in the chapter just before this, in Isaiah 54. When the Lord started speaking to us about being a sending church, I want you to be an Antioch. Acts 13, we sent out seed teams in the church graft and sent more people off for ordination training. The Lord's word transforms. It will not return to him empty if we come and receive and feed on his word. And the Lord transforms us as we come before the preached word as well in an extraordinary and unexpected way at times. But he chooses to do that. So I pray in this season and as we prepare ourselves to enter Advent, we would be hungry for God's word. We'd be really hungry for the transforming power of God's word. Because God's word does something in our lives that nothing else can do. So how hungry are you at the moment for God's word? For God's word for your timing now. For God's word as you seek to grow as a passionate Christ follower. The invitation we have here is to come. To come and in coming we crown him the Lord of love. Come, come and receive his outrageous generosity. Come and see his purposes for our lives. Come, because now is the time. And come and be transformed. Let's just be quiet for a few moments as the band come up. So we just allow ourselves to receive what God has particularly wanted to say to each of us this morning. Father, we want to crown you the Lord of love in our lives. Lord, at a deeper and deeper level. And Lord, may we be good receivers of your invitation. Lord, may we not just, just come once a week. But Lord, may we come daily. And may we come with an expectancy and a hunger knowing that you satisfy our thirst, that you meet our hunger, Lord. And Lord, may we live lives of invitation to others as well. May we be great signposts to your invitation to them. For Jesus' glory. Amen.